Uh, and now uh, an old friend of mine, uh, I can think of nobody better to speak of election law since she's been involved in so many lawsuits uh, and is defined, of course, uh, when you read about her, tenacious <laughs> and uh, the pride of Colorado with the Citizen Center, the woman who fought tenaciously to keep your vote private, Marilyn Marks. Gosh, you guys are too kind, and, and thank you, Bob, and thank you so much for the invitation to come from Charlotte, North Carolina, where I'm living now, and um, our group now is called the Coalition for Good Governance, which I'll, I'll speak a little bit about. Um, so you interrupt me every time I say something that you disagree with. You're the lawyer, not me, okay? <laughs> so I'm calling my talk today Trials and Tribulations of Trials. Now, Jim told me that I had to speak optimistically and positively. So, Bob, maybe it's time for you to come up and me to sit down. Um, but um, it, it is, it's, been, it's been a tough time recently, and so seeking election fairness in the courts can be quite a challenge, although I enjoy it. Do you want to go to the next slide? I can't see what's up here, so you guys can signal me if it's like totally the wrong thing. Here, it's here. Um, so, my personal experience as an election integrity plaintiff involves more cases than I can now count, 25 plus cases in Colorado, and now probably the biggest case I've ever worked on is the case in Georgia. Um, the, the, that I'll come talk to you about in a moment. The 25 cases in Colorado were primarily around challenging the violation of the secret ballot. Why do I care about something so old-fashioned as the secret ballot? Two major reasons. One, which we're going to hear about from David Jefferson today, and that is, you know, when our rights to a secret ballot are given up, it makes internet voting excuse all the easier. Right now, it's one of the barriers to internet voting. But also, because of the invasions of privacy that become so easy with the technology, and um, earlier today, you heard uh, Professor Bryant talking about Cambridge Analytica. Did any of you all see the article in um, the paper, no, the press maybe three weeks ago, where the Cambridge Analytica person in charge of the Facebook work said that they, can, they had records on who voters previously voted for? And they were asked, how, how could you know this, Cambridge Analytica? And the answer was, that's our secret sauce. Think about how valuable that information is. And think about how, how available it is. Um, Harvey Branscombe and I have worked for a very long time in Colorado to try to remove identifiable barcodes on the ballots. They're sitting on hard drives, all of, at least 45 counties now, where the ballot voted years ago by the individual voter can be, can be connected. If that data is out there on hard drives, what makes us think it's so securely in the hands of trusted election officials. So, um, I, you know, there's got to be a, an enormous market in it. Are you standing up to disagree, Bob? No. <laughs> I'm just thinking about coffee. Okay, give me some way around. I will. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, anyway, it's, it's a really hot button with me. And I see more and more opportunities for just egregious violation of the secret ballot. And if there's anything you can do with the millennials, please convince them that, that this is a really dangerous idea to have the ability for anyone to see how we vote. I could spend the rest of the weekend lecturing about that. But that's one of our big hot buttons here. Um, one of the things that we also do is uh, election contest where there have been violations of um, constitutional rights. 
and we've done a lot of transparency, open records lawsuits. Um, now, the big thing I'm working on right now is, you all know the Congressional District 6 election in Georgia that was the most expensive congressional election ever. Um, you all remember that, that took place in June. Well, our organization um, took that to court to challenge the outcome there. And one of the things we've learned since we started the case, the DREs, the Diebold, not saying all DREs, the Diebold DREs actually violate the rights to a secret ballot. Yes, the votes are not randomized, they're stored in order of how people vote. So all it takes is a list of the order in which people vote, dump the memory card and you know how everybody votes. That wasn't the reason we brought the lawsuit, but we've learned it in the process. Um, now, the main reason we did it was because uh, to show the incredible vulnerability um, to cyber attack in the entire statewide system. Let's go to the next slide. So the role of the Coalition for Good Governance, and we didn't mention it in the, in the bio, we use Citizen Center, but really the, the organization I represent now is a 501c3. We tend to act as the organizational plaintiff, be a co-plaintiff with local voters. And um, when we do election contests, and we've done quite a few election contests, we do not do election contests that are partisan, not for a party, not for a candidate, but instead for voters challenging that election generally based on constitutional grounds, whether it's a due process violation, a, um, a secret ballot violation. Um, so um, that has been our role as well in this, in this Georgia a case that's happening right now in federal court. Shall we go to the next slide? Sorry, Jim. It's harder than it sounds. He told me to be positive, but I already had this slide made up. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in, in our open records work, and we did quite a lot of open records lawsuits in, in Colorado saying ballots are public records. The public ought to be able to come in and count every single ballot. That's actually how we ran into the secret ballot problem, because the election officials said, you can't do that, it'll show how people voted. <laughs> we thought that was funny. We thought, oh, can you believe they would say such a stupid thing? They were saying, what they were saying was truthful. And we were astounded to, to learn that. That's how we got working on the, on the secret ballot problems. But um, litigating transparent, election transparency, it sounds so boring, it's really hard to get funding for. Officials will fight endlessly with their taxpayer budget to do anything that will keep their anti-transparency uh, policies in place. And Harvey Branscombe and I actually have been sued by election officials for even asking for open records. Right, Harvey? <laughs> yes. I mean, that is a good way to intimidate transparency seekers. Yes, we had to go to state court for months to defend ourselves. I've been sued, I think, six times by Colorado state officials merely for asking for records. Um, so, um, one of, the, one of the other problems in doing this is the state courts really do not want to, to rule against their local election officials. Um, and I found in Colorado, particularly in the rural counties, where the courthouse is in, in the same building with the election officials and the judge has lunch every day with the election officials, I mean, you come in as a stranger from out of town, it's really, you, you start out way down in the hole. And courts are just very, very reluctant to hear these things. It's also hard to get uh, local donors to, to help support these things because they always want to say, well, tell me how it makes my candidate win. 
And I will tell you that both parties are equally bad about this. It's not just the Republicans, <laughs> okay? Um, and I will say that as a very disappointed, very upset Republican, okay? I'm not too happy, at, I'm at all happy with my party right now, but I will tell you that um, both parties have the same issue. Shall we go to the next slide? Okay, contesting an election. Time frames are compressed. Um, discovery is limited. Time is really inadequate to gather the facts. Usually you've got to get an election contest into the court within five to 10 days, depending on the state, after an election is certified. And it usually takes, um, it, it's, it's generally impossible because one, it's expensive, You've got to find a lawyer who is up to speed and has time in his calendar to do nothing but, his or her calendar, to do nothing but. And um, candidates on both parties, in both parties, absolutely refuse to make any kind of contingency plans. After all, they are so sure they're going to win. They're so sure the system won't cheat them that you cannot get them to do any planning. So all of a sudden, you get the call right after the election certified going, I got to do something. And then it's then it is such an unpopular position. Candidates and plaintiffs get intimidated and get talked out of pursuing the election contest. We have even um, done election contest where the plaintiffs, after it was in, in court, the plaintiffs got so intimidated by the local officials that they pulled out. Um, and you know, they, it was a very winnable case that we were really looking forward to, to taking to appeals court. Facts were absolutely black and white. But they were so black and white that officials didn't have any problem using all their muscle. And then the state laws make it really, really hard to contest an election. Because when you have a violation of, of constitutional rights, but the state courts want you to do is say, well, prove to me that there were enough people impacted. There were enough people whose rights were impacted to have changed the result. On things like secret ballots, where you could never get that information. Let's go to the next slide. So lessons learned. Um, cases will always become far more complex than you ever imagined. When I took on this um, CD6 Georgia case, I had no idea I was going to be back in secret ballot land. I didn't know that the DREs, the Debo DREs, could trace votes. And the thing I'm the most angry about today, expect destruction of key records. I have not been in, a, in any of the significant cases yet where we did not find intentional destruction of key records that we needed and there was no accountability for it because generally the courts will say, oh, they didn't mean to, they didn't understand what that delete button really did. You know, it was, it was Aunt Sally who works in the official's office and she didn't really understand that 22 months of federal record <laughs> retention meant that you really have to keep it. Months. Um, only engage, and, and, and I will say that I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but we've just come across some really disappointing news in our Georgia case with respect to destruction of key records. Um, only engage lawyers with proven election expertise. I have scars all over my body to prove every one of these lessons learned, so. Um, don't expect to find pro bono attorneys with the adequate time or expertise. Choose your venues very carefully. Don't assume that you can go to any court in the state and get a fair hearing, particularly when you've got a lot of strong local politics. Go to federal court if you can. It's not always easy, particularly if you have an election contest. You generally can't bring it in federal court. But if you can wrap in enough federal claims, 
try to do it, you'll get away from at least the local politics. If you're going to be nonpartisan, expect it to be hard to get funds. People want to invest in their candidate winning, not a fair process. And expect, just as all civil rights litigants do, expect to lose a lot of good cases because it's really hard stuff. But to advance these civil rights, we have to keep trying. You want to go to the next slide, um, Dale? So the current Georgia case that's in federal court, we filed it in state court. It was an election contest. We absolutely lucked up because the defendants removed it to federal court, where we would have wanted to be all along, but we didn't have the right to put it there. Our case there um, relates to paperless DREs in, in Georgia, and um, they don't even meet the minimum statutory requirements. Uh, in fact, Barbara Simons is one of our experts, and in her affidavit, she went through statute by statute and, uh, of the requirement for the DREs and she said, well, can't, the DREs can't do this, they can't do this, they can't test for this, they're not auditable, auditable in this way. And um, one of the things we have going for us in this case is that we've got the, the best set of national experts around. Um, in this case, the, the voting system was compromised statewide with all databases, for all 159 counties in the state, all passwords for every single machine, six and a half million records with all voter data. So security numbers, driver's license numbers, address, birth dates, the, uh, the, the supposedly private protected files were out on the internet with no protection for anyone to see no password required, no authentication required, for what we think was at least three years in the run-up to the November 16 election. And um, so Stephen Rosenfeld talked a few moments ago about how Secretary Kemp had a lot of crazy things going. So Secretary Kemp left, his agents left all of this voter information out there for the taking for years. No one has challenged him on this. It is part of our lawsuit. Um, when we started this case as a election contest, it's always really, really tough to do an election contest, particularly if you're doing a federal office like a, congress uh, a, a congressman. In Georgia, the law permits in a federal office, or in it's going to be a congressional office, for the moment that the election is certified, that person can get sworn in. So in the case of Representative Handel, within a few minutes of the certification by Secretary Kemp, her hand was on the Bible, standing there with Paul Ryan, and she was sworn in. I mean, there's no way to file an election contest in a few minutes. And so one of the things that I hope we will see with this case is that ability for an election to get away without any challenge, that that, that um, would be stricken from Georgia law. I mean, to me, that's a half step from tyranny. When anything can happen on election, we, we watched all the way through, we protested from long before the election to, um, we protested all along, and then at the end of the election, slam, it was, it was done. Um, we're seeking to prohibit DREs in the future, and again, we're after the violation of constitutional rights, including secret ballots. Let's go to the, to the next slide. So Jim, here's the positive happy slide. The, um, <laughs> Um, I should have put a smiley face on it. Um, the benefits of court decisions can make permanent improvement in voting rights. Officials are then actually held publicly accountable and the issues can be resolved or exposed in the press. Um, 
Dale, let's go to the next slide. Okay, questions. I'm happy to take questions, but I have one for you that you can either answer now or answer for me later at cocktails or lunch. I, I'd, I'd like to have a sooner rather than later answer. Um, and that is, how, how can my organization, Coalition for Good Governance, get broad-based funding? How can we do this to carry on this work? Even this, um, the uh, election contest, or excuse me, the Georgia election we're doing right now is going to take some massive funding infusions. We have got to go get attorneys who have more election experience than, than where we are right now. And it's, it, this case could take years to conclude, particularly because, and Bob, you may be interested in this, one of the things that we, we want to do in this case is we would like the court to rule that the right to a secret ballot is a fundamental liberty interest in this country. It's, you know, it, it's, you would think we are here, yeah. but we're not. Okay, all right, so are you stepping up to tell me how to get more funding? <laughs> I, I apologize profoundly. <laughs> yes. Um, first question, does Analytica know how I voted in Walnut Creek, California? What kind of voting system do you have? It was a machine voting system with a paper trail. I don't remember what the brand name was. E, S, and S. In, in, which, in which system of E, S, and S? Scan. Scan system. I guess I, I would really need more information to, to give you the answer to that. Um, Harvey, you have any, any ideas? Not, with, not when we don't know what model or anything. I, I don't want to get wrapped around that particular axle. Do you think we could create a, an election system? I realize elections are obviously political, but what could we do to separate the administration of elections, the operation of the polling places, how the ballots are done and how they're counted, completely isolated from the political system, uh, not only in terms of personnel, but also in terms of funding. Okay. I don't know that I would actually uh, want to separate it from the political system. In fact, the, the kind of neutrality I like is to have balanced interest all the way down at the most grassroots citizen running the election level. I'm a person who believes that running elections is not the government's job. It's our job. And <laughs> that, that fits the bill. I'm sorry? That fits the bill. It takes the political process and gets it out of the hands of the politicians. W right. But, but we can all still be political. I can represent my party. You can represent yours. And we can sit down and count the ballots together. But we're going to need more grassroots education, even starting in high schools, that it is our duty to run our elections in our, in our colleges and on and on. We have to convince people that it is worth their time to, that we control the elections, not the guys who are getting elected. Yes, sir. Yeah. I know this is uh, sacrilegious and you said you could talk for a whole weekend on this topic. Yes. Secret ballot. Are you inviting me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Any weekend you like. <laughs> I'm here right all now. All week long, too. Um, here's the question. Given that openness is a virtue and privacy is currently more problematic than it ever has been, wouldn't non-secret ballots be the ultimate control? All voters would then demand that their votes be counted and they could see whether they were or they weren't. Yes. So could, and the answer is, yeah, they could see that, and so could the bad guys. And, and I would say, no, no, no. I have worked in too many environments, particularly, particularly s small towns, rural locations. Those of us who live in metropolitan areas don't understand the pressures that go on in small towns across rural America. One of our plaintiffs is a mayor of this, in Georgia case, one of our plaintiffs is the mayor of a town with 850 voters. One of the reasons he's in this is to say, wait a minute, 
let's think about how this affects my city council and my voters. If they, if their votes can be determined, who's going to come to the, who's going to vote and then come to the board and ask for a liquor license or a zoning permit? And so, absolutely not. It's, it's. I think it's um, unrealistic to think that we could all somehow figure out how to verify our vote and the dangers. Our great, great, great grandfathers figured this out in the late 1800s, and. Um, it is it is an incredibly dangerous proposition to to allow anyone to see how we vote, even your spouse. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thank thank you for being here. Um, so one of the uh, aspects that you talked about was difficulty in getting funding. About since you're nonpartisan, uh, I've assisted with uh, one political campaign recently. Uh, and the uh, election integrity and transparency seems to be something of a third rail, like, oh my God, we don't want to focus on that because they'll just call us tinfoil hat wearing uh, exactly. conspiracy nuts. And uh, even though the, I, I think the truth is that most people in the country do not vote because they don't trust the system. But then when a, a, a local candidate, I live in San Francisco, I have a friend who wants to run for local office. Um, I, I said, you know, what happened to Bernie? Look at what happened to Bernie. Look at what happened across t t uh, at least 20 states in the Democratic primary, voter, road per uh, voter uh, roll purging, et cetera. Um, w why can't you focus on your, your, your campaign on the election fraud issues and, and how their system is rigged? And, you know, he says, well, I just don't think people wake up in the morning uh, saying, like, oh, I'm worried about uh, elections. They're worried about how they pay their bills. So. How, uh, what kind of successes have you had in your organization in uh, raising awareness or piquing interest or uh, getting people to actually even believe that this is a real issue or concern, a real concrete thing that happens? I, I wish I had the right answer for you. I don't uh, because it's very hard to get the press, the mainstream press involved in this. But I think we are lucky, thanks to the Russians. I mean, I really hate to say it, but, you know, finally the mainstream press is waking up because of the Russians. Isn't that a shame? Um, and I think maybe the best thing for us to do is continue to play off of that. Even if we have to say, oh, we don't want North Korea running, running our elections. And um, unfortunately, we may have to look offshore to find the excuse to convince our people at home. And keep working on the press, but that's a hard job. I wish I had answers. Thanks. Should I try to take any more, or am I dumb? And I'm dumb. Done. Yes. Hi, Marilyn. It's Hi. nice to see you off of Twitter. I'm, I'm Jenny. Um, <laughs> Hi. Hello. Uh, so as you know, I'm an attorney, but not an election attorney. And something that has really struck me based on a very cursory understanding of how the um, election challenges seem to go is that often they seem to fail, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but often they seem to fail on the notion that the plaintiffs who are challenging the election have to prove that the um, voting system was actually hacked. And sometimes they even go further and say not only that, you have to prove that it changed the election. And something that has struck me, just based on a general understanding of burden of proof, is that is that typically, at least in, under California law, um, the burden of proof, even on damages, is on the party that has uh, the control of the facts. So you can even shift sometimes the burden of proof on damages to the defendant in the case if they have exclusive control of the facts. And what strikes me is in these election cases, it's typically the election officials who have access to the voting equipment and if optical scanners happen to be used, uh, access to the paper ballots that could be used to determine whether the result is legitimate or not. And I'm wondering, to your knowledge, have any election cases thus far made the argument on burden shifting? And if not, do you think that might be worth trying? I think it would be difficult in most states, and I'll, I'll let Bob answer that. Uh, but I think that's more unique to California in terms of the burden shifting, as well as one of the things we know in DREs, nobody can prove anything. Thank you all. All right. All right. Marilyn Marks, Coalition for Good Government. Great job. And uh, we got Paul Thomas coming up. Uh, but there was a case I was involved in, the Squire, a judgeship case where the judge ruled that 
there was no way to tell any outcome of any case because of the structure of the voting system. So she lost. 